be a genetic condition, meaning that we have to talk to each of the families about their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and how they need to be screened, and we'll talk about that in a slide or two later. There's a lot of misconception out there about exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We want our patients to be, exercise, to, to be able to exercise like the rest of our patients do. That is, as part of a healthy lifestyle, you should be able to be physically active, and we can talk to each of our patients about that. One of the more concerning things is there is plenty of information that it is possible for patients to have fatal heart rhythms or sudden cardiac death. But the reality is that happens to a very small percentage of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When you come for an evaluation, you will undergo a series of risk factor assessments to help you decide and understand what your risk is and make important treatment decisions, and we'll talk about that. What we're going to focus on for most of today's discussion are the other therapies, medicine, and in particular, surgery, the myectomy, that we use to treat patients who have symptoms due to their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, this slide just provides you some context. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an unnatural thickening of the myocardium. That's the heart muscle wall itself. On the upper left, you can see a depiction of a normal heart. In the middle and on the top right are the patients who have septal hypertrophy or thick, un, asymmetric thickening of their septum. But it's possible to have the thickening anywhere or everywhere in the heart. So we'll talk a little bit about the septal hypertrophy and treatments for that. But then again, on the bottom right are those patients who have hypertrophy primarily in the mid-ventricle or apex of the heart, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we'll talk about how we manage that as well. So, I mentioned family screening. With hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the general thoughts about the genetics are that each patient's children have a 50-50 chance of inheriting this condition from them. So because of that, we want to extend screening. Usually we start screening when, when the children enter adolescence, and we screen them every year or year and a half during their adolescence or when they're engaged in competitive athletics. And when we're talking, when, they're, when their children are adults, and for the patient's siblings, we recommend echocardiograms every five years. That's the standard way that we've been screening family members for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for years. It is important to recognize that genetic testing is also possible, where we take the patient's blood sample, try to identify the genetic mutation in that individual, and if we can find that mutation, then we can test their family members to see who else has the mutation and therefore has risk for developing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The logistics, the pros and cons of both of these techniques would be discussed with any patient during their visit with us um, in the HCM clinic. That family screening applies to all types of patients with HCM, regardless of where the hypertrophy is. The same as this slide. The general treatment guidelines are, as I mentioned before, we want our patients to be physically active as part of being healthy. We do caution people against extreme exposures and extreme efforts, uh, but we can participate in low to moderate intensity exercise as part of a healthy lifestyle. Because we are focusing on patients today with obstructive symptoms, we do also like to emphasize that it's important that they avoid becoming dehydrated because that can make the obstruction and the symptoms worse. So hydrating before, during, and after exercise is always an important aspect of being able to participate in exercise. This is an uh, image of the very first publication that is recognized to represent the first medical recognition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see it's almost 60 years old now. Now, I bring this up to show the advancement of our knowledge about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy over the years, because these first eight patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see they're all young, age 45 or less. This was actually an autopsy series. So the first eight patients that were discovered with this, with this condition were patients who had passed away from this condition. And what we've learned since then, as I mentioned earlier, is that is not at all what we recognize today, that most patients can live with this disease very well without an early death. However, about 1% of patients do have dangerous heart rhythms. So part of the evaluation is to follow guidelines that have been put forth both by North American and European cardiology experts in the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to assess each individual patient's risk 
and help them decide whether or not they want to get a defibrillator to serve as a safety net against those dangerous heart rhythms. Now, these are guidelines and not policies, and the nuance there is that risk stratification helps patients understand what their risk is, just like when you're doing financial planning for your retirement, you have to understand your own risk tolerance. So our job in the clinic is to help your, put your risk in context of other patients and help you make the best decision for yourself. And both of those guideline statements have, have very specific wording in them, and they're depicted on the screen now, that talks about shared decision making with the patient. If I tell you that your risk is 5% over five years, that means something different to each patient. Some patients find that scary and might want to pursue getting a defibrillator. Other patients find that reassuring and will say no thank you to having an implantable device. But again, I want to emphasize that's part of shared decision making when you come to an expert center to help you understand where you fit in the scheme of patients and which treatments might be available to you. So all of those things I've talked about to this point apply to all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether it's obstructive, non-obstructive, apical, uh, anywhere, those things apply. We're now going to shift gear and talk about those patients who have symptoms uh, and how we manage the symptoms. And you don't need to worry about the details on this slide other than the main two bubbles at the top. On the left is a depiction of the fact that about two-thirds of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have what we call obstruction. That's where it's difficult for the heart to squeeze blood out of the heart because the thick area is blocking the path that blood takes out of the heart. Two-thirds of patients have that, and that's where we start talking about medications and the typical myectomy that we've talked about over the years for relieving symptoms. But we shouldn't forget on the right-hand side that 100% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have problems with diastole, or the relaxation phase of the heart cycle. The thick heart muscle is stiffer than usual. This means it takes more pressure to put blood into the heart before it can squeeze any blood out. And that extra pressure in the heart is what patients who, even though they don't have obstruction, can feel shortness of breath. The difficulty with the diastolic phenomenon is that there aren't simple, easy medications to make that get better. And so we're often use, using medications to help manage it a little bit. And then as Dr. Schaff will talk to you about in a moment, we've developed this approach using surgical techniques to help the diastolic function of the heart and to help the heart perform more efficiently for those individuals. So we're going to go back to this slide just as a way to point out that we're going to focus the next couple of slides on the people that have septal hypertrophy causing left ventricular outflow obstruction, the more typical patients that we use myectomy for. This obstruction is dynamic. It gets worse when we exercise. It gets worse when the heart beats harder, when the blood pressure goes down a little bit, or if a patient's dehydrated. All those things happen as soon as you stand up out of your chair and walk across the room, which is why our patients tend to have symptoms when they are exerting themselves much more so than at rest. We have learned over the years that there are some very specific changes in medications that we can do that can help many patients, but there are some patients who have recurrent symptoms that we can't manage with medications, and that's when we talk about doing more definitive therapies like myectomy. And so at this point, I'm going to turn to Dr. Schaff to talk to you about our experience with myectomy at Mayo Clinic. So Hartzell, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Steve. Um, in the years past, it was uncertain how important obstruction was in the uh, long-term prognosis of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I wanted to start with this slide, which showed survival of patients who had no obstruction. These are patients with diastolic dysfunction without obstruction. And this is the survival of patients that had this obstruction to the outflow of blood. And this was an important study that convinced most cardiologists and surgeons that there was a penalty to having obstruction as regards the, the survival of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a, a very important finding. This is a study from the Mayo Clinic. In fact, Dr. Amon was the author of this study. And in, in this investigation, we looked at the survival of patients who had had septal myectomy. In other words, the myectomy to relieve the obstruction put the patients back on the survival curve of patients without obstruction. And as you can see here, the patients that had an operation at Mayo Clinic for 
septomyectomy had a survival that was almost identical to an age and sex match population. So it appears that the operation to relieve obstruction improves patient survival, or at least gets them back to a near normal survival. Now symptoms can come back, and the symptoms that we uh, generally see in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy include shortness of breath, chest pain, and then in some cases syncope. And this slide shows the recurrence of, of symptoms in patients with syncope. Now, if you have a myectomy, if you have the obstruction relieved with myectomy, your chance of having recurrent symptoms in the future are about 10%. Whereas if you're treated medically, the chance of recurrent symptoms is about 40%. So surgery is, is useful in not only perhaps improving survival, but clearly in improving the patient's symptoms. At our clinic, we have a very large experience with myectomy for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This shows a number of patients at Mayo who have had the operation through 2015 and through the first part of this year now this number is over 3,000. When we meet with patients before surgery we go over some important uh, things that they should think about. The first uh, and most important thing is the risk of the operation. For patients who have no other uh, serious medical illnesses and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction is their main problem, the operative risk is less than 1%. The gradient that you see here, the 67, that's the severity of the outflow tract obstruction. That should be, in a normal person, zero. And in our patients, we would expect after surgery to have a gradient in the single digits, and the average in this series was about 3 millimeters of mercury. The post-op NYHA that you see here is a, is a measure of their exercise capacity and class three or four are patients who are significantly limited and after surgery we tell patients that about 90 to 95 percent of patients are class one or two which means that they have minimal disability. So these are, the, these are important facts that we try to explain to our patients before an operation. Now I'll go through a few of the steps in a septal myectomy. And this is a transaortic septal myectomy, and this is what the surgeon sees when the aorta is opened. I won't go through the, all the steps in the procedure, but I wanted to show you the septal myectomy, the transaortic septal myectomy, so that when we get to the trans, transapical myectomy, you can understand the difference. Now, when the aorta is open, and these cusps here are the cusps of the aortic valve. This is the septum and the whitish area here is scar. And that's the endocardial scar where the mitral valve comes up as the heart contracts and touches the septum. And that is a guide for us when we do the septal myectomy. So in this slide you see the, the knife that's cutting the septum and you can see in the inset this is the first incision that we make in the septum. It's important to carry that incision in the septum far enough into the ventricle that you completely relieve obstruction. And we've learned from patients that have been referred for second operations that in most instances the operation didn't work the first time, not because of regrowth of the muscle, but because the, the surgeon didn't carry the incision far enough into the ventricle. And so we make a, a very uh, great effort to take out muscle towards the middle of the ventricle or towards the papillary muscles. And this is the second cut that we make in the septum here. And this is what it looks like from the surgeon's view when we make that second excision of muscle in the septum. Now occasionally there's abnormal attachments of the mitral valve. In this slide you can see that the arrow here just shows the how we would divide these abnormal attachments, what we call cordy from the papillary muscles and from the anterior leaflet that will free up the mitral valve and in some cases that's necessary. In other cases there's an abnormal attachment or an anomalous papillary muscle and that's this papillary muscle shown right here. You can see the arrow going back and forth. This papillary muscle should look like these down here with cordal attachments and the cordal attachments are those fine white lines shown here. When you have an abnormal papillary muscle that inserts into this area of the, of the uh, mitral valve, that needs to be removed when we do a septal myectomy. 
if the papillary muscle inserts in other areas, we might not have to remove it, especially if it inserts into the edge of the valve here. Uh, we don't want to remove that papillary muscle because that might cause mitral regurgitation or leakage. Now, there are some papillary muscles, and this is, a, this is an echocardiogram showing the septum and the posterior wall of the heart, and this is the abnormal papillary muscle inserting into the mitral valve right here. And this just shows that in, that is the papillary muscle, there's the mitral valve. This shows how that abnormal papillary muscle narrows the outflow tract. So now when the blood gets out of the ventricle, it has to be pushed through this narrowed outflow tract, and we have to remove this papillary muscle during the transaortic myectomy. Now this was an, it was an unusual case because the single papillary muscle gave cordal attachments here and also created obstruction. So the way this was treated was just removing a part of the papillary muscle. We think it's very important to measure pressures inside the heart at the time of the operation. Now, to, to be certain that we've done an adequate myectomy, the cardiologist helped us in the operating room by doing a transesophageal echocardiogram, but we also measure pressures, and pressures document that gradient. The gradient is the obstruction. So we put a needle in the aorta, you can see that here, another needle in the ventricle shown here, and we look at the tracing and the difference between the pressure in the aorta and the left ventricle is the gradient. That averages, as I showed before, about 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury in most patients. And what, this is a tracing that we would get, a typical tracing, and then that's before operation, and after operation, in the operating room, we measure pressures again, and this is what we ought to see, no gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta if the myectomy is adequate. So it's the measurement of pressures as well as the echocardiogram that tell us when we've done e enough of a myectomy to relieve the symptoms. There are other areas of obstruction. Now you can have what we call midventricular obstruction, and that's shown in this upper inset where you see this whitish area and a bulge in the mid portion of the septum. And we get to this mid-ventricular obstruction through this transapical incision that we'll uh, talk a little bit more about later. And in a few patients, patients that have a very large septum that extends from the subaortic area towards the apex, we do both a transaortic myectomy, which is removing this muscle beneath the aortic valve, and then also an incision in the apex to remove septum from this area. And these are, are unusual more extreme cases, but we think that doing this more thorough myectomy reduces the chance that the patient will come back with symptoms. Now, one of the common findings in patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is mitral valve leakage. And there's some debate amongst surgeons and cardiologists about how often things need to be done to the mitral valve in addition to the myectomy. It's been our practice at the Mayo Clinic to do an adequate myectomy to completely relieve that gradient before we do anything to the mitral valve unless there's obvious mitral valve damage from other diseases. And when we looked at a group of patients, about 2,000 patients who had had myectomy, we looked at this group of patients to see how often we had to do something to the mitral valve. And it turns out that we, had, that we did a myectomy only in 96% of the patients. In other words, in less than 5% of patients did we have to do anything to the mitral valve once we had relieved that obstruction. Thank you, Hartzell. That's uh, it's a really good preview of the myectomy that we've practiced and have been talking about for years. And I wanted to just kind of conclude that section with a discussion about some publications that came out earlier this year. And this, this is talking about the importance of getting care for diseases like that at centers that really focus on managing these diseases. And, and the first study, which represent the first three bars on this graph, look at how hospitals perform in terms of patient outcomes, whether the, whether the hospital is doing low volumes of this operation versus what they define as high volume in, the op, in, in that paper. And you can see that one of the measures had to do with just simply the chance of the risk of dying from the operation. And the way we've depicted that here, that in the low volume hospitals, hospitals that were doing very few of these operations, about one in six patients that had this operation died within 30 days of the operation. 
It's better if you go to a middle volume hospital and better yet if you go to a high volume hospital where only one in 26 patients died. But the point here is that there is a big difference between being a high volume hospital and being a center that specializes in the care of patients uh, from the beginning to the end of the disease completely. So at expert centers, which includes Mayo and some of the other premier institutions, of which there's only very few uh, in North America that do this operation, we uh, can go more than 1,500 patients before a patient dies within 30 days of the operation. We think it's really important that patients know about these statistics when they're making choices for care. The same type of graph can be constructed about relief of symptoms. As Dr. Schaff alluded to, the most common reason for us to do an, a redo myectomy is that the first myectomy wasn't done adequately, and usually that's because it was done by someone who just hasn't had the experience that Dr. Schaff and others have had in this, in this condition. And so we just want to put this information out there for you to understand the difference between expertise, where the surgeon and the medical cardiologist and electrophysiologist work as a unit focusing on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to help our patients achieve the best possible outcomes from the procedures they can. Now, with that, we want to turn our attention to the more specialized case of looking at the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient and the therapies available to them. From a medical cardiologist standpoint, as I mentioned, we're talking about someone whose ventricle is very small, so there isn't much space for the blood to go into, which means each heartbeat doesn't pump as much blood as usual, and it takes more pressure to get the ventricle ready to pump that blood, and those are challenging circumstances to deal with with medications. And so, Dr. Schaff, this is one of the patients that you operated on a few years ago, and you want to walk the audience through these pictures. Yes. This, uh Thank you, Steve. This is an echocardiogram, and the, the upper panel shows the heart beating, and you can see this black area right here is the pumping chamber. It should extend all the way out where my arrow is, but you can see that that part of the heart is completely obliterated by this thickened muscle. So as the heart hypertrophies, as it thickens, it thickens inward, and this inward thickening of the muscle encroaches on the volume of the ventricle. Now, it's a very difficult problem to treat medically because there are no medicines that enlarge the ventricle. Uh, symptomatic improvement is seen in a few patients with medical treatment, but once a patient gets to this stage in the disease, if they're symptomatic, really the only other alternative short of the operation that I'll show you is a heart transplant. And in fact, of the first four patients that had the apical myectomy to enlarge the ventricle, Three of them had been referred to Mayo Clinic for a heart transplant. Now, this on this side shows a patient, a schematic of a heart where there's apical hypertrophy. And you can see that there's no chamber here, just there's just a slit-like orifice. All of this area here should be, should be functioning pumping ventricle. And when we looked at this and thought about an operation to improve the size of the heart, we thought that if we could increase the size of the ventricle by taking muscle out from the inside of the ventricle here, not to relieve obstruction, but to enlarge the ventricle, that that might increase the pumping capacity of the heart in these symptomatic patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, there were a couple of problems with this. The first is that you can't get to the apex of the heart through the aorta. So we did this apical incision that, that I'll show you. Uh, and then the other problem is understanding how much muscle to take out and being certain not to injure some of the structures on the inside of the heart, uh, like the papillary muscles. This just shows a, this shows a ventriculogram. Now this is a heart catheterization and the cardiologist here has put dye into the ventricle. There you see the catheter and you can see the black dye and you can see this is the only pumping chamber the patient has. If you look out here, this is the part of the heart that's obliterated by muscle. This is the same patient after the operation. You can see that the heart rate's a little bit faster, but now you have a pumping chamber out here that's helping with blood flow. It reduces the pressure inside the heart at end diastole and increases the volume of blood that's ejected with each beat. 
And this is an echocardiogram. You saw the echocardiogram before where there was no pumping chamber uh, towards the apex of the heart. This is a patient who has had an apical myectomy where we enlarge the ventricle in this area. You can see here that there's pumping chamber out at the apex. And here you can see that pumping chamber again. So the purpose of the apical myectomy in patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is to enlarge the ventricle to improve the stroke volume. There's one other group of patients that we approach through an apical incision. And these are the patients that I mentioned earlier who have midventricular obstruction. This is an echocardiogram. It shows the apex of the heart here. This is the aortic outflow here. And the color that you see here shows acceleration of blood flow. Now that acceleration of blood flow reflects obstruction. Generally, for patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the acceleration of blood flow is in this area. That's the subaortic area. But in a su another subgroup of patients, there's obstruction at the midventricle. And in these patients, the papillary muscle touches the septum. You can see the obstruction there and a wide open outflow tract. And once again, this is approached through the apex. Now, this is an incision in the apex of the heart. And you can see the whitey scar on the anterolateral. This is a papillary muscle, and this is a septum. And you can see how close the papillary muscle and the septum are together. And that narrowed area, all of the blood has to get through uh, during the ejection. So what we do in a case like this is to excise this muscle from the septum and then to shave this papillary muscle so it's not quite so large to relieve obstruction. So the apical incision, in addition to being a pathway that we use to enlarge the heart, is also a good uh, a pathway to relieve midventricular obstruction. And I'll show a couple of other examples. This is midventricular obstruction in a patient who developed what we call an apical pouch or apical aneurysm. And this is the obstruction, the point of obstruction. This patient has a wide open outflow tract, no subaortic obstruction, but severe midventricular obstruction. And patients with these apical pouches, many of them, or most of them, are asymptomatic, but they can develop symptoms from irregular heartbeats, ventricular arrhythmias, or from blood clot that forms in here because there's there's no movement of blood. Blood gets into this chamber and it's not pumped out. And occasionally patients will develop blood clots here that make their way out of the heart and can cause a stroke. Now, I'll show you the, the procedure that we do for this. And here is the color flow again that shows the acceleration of blood across that narrowed area. And here is the patient, That's this, this is the same patient whose apical pouch has been opened and now we've taken out muscle from the midventricle and then we repair this area, this apical pouch. So I'll, I'll just finish with some key points. The apical myectomy is different than a subaortic myectomy because we're not trying to relieve obstruction. In general, we're trying to enlarge the ventricle. It's not always benign. I think that uh, many cardiologists, because most patients have a good course with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, don't recognize that some can be very symptomatic uh, and then some can have a sudden cardiac death. The symptoms are improved by this myectomy that I showed you earlier to enlarge the left ventricle. And when we measure cardiac function, and we've done detailed studies, the cardiologists at Mayo have done detailed studies of the hemodynamics after this, we see that it lowers the end diastolic pressure and improves the diastolic function of the patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, when there's no subaortic obstruction, there's, there's no SAM. Uh, dyspnea and angina are common symptoms of patients with midventricular obstruction. And then this apical pouch that I showed you in that very last patient is present in about 20 to 30 percent of patients, and it can lead to thrombus formation or ir arrhythmias, these irregular heartbeats. And in these, in these cases, we also approach this transapically. So the transapical incision is useful in several different groups of patients. Thank you, Hartzell. That's a great review of the uh, myectomy procedures.
So just want to remind you that the guidelines documents that have been authored by both the North American and European cardiologists do recommend that these procedures be performed by specialists who do this uh, as a major portion of their practice. And as an example at Mayo Clinic, while we have 10 cardiovascular surgeons, there are only two of the surgeons who do this procedure so that they're maintaining enough volume and expertise to know that we're doing the right thing for each patient that comes into the room. So at this point, I think we'll stop the slides because I know there are some questions that have come in and we'll uh, try to address some of your questions as we go on. You can continue to submit those and I know that on the links on the website, you can have access to some of our other uh, HCM educational materials. So the first question that came in is really a good one. Someone says, I have HCM, can I see any cardiologist or should I see someone who specializes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's a good question, so I've answered that to some degree earlier, but what I would say is if you're having symptoms, you need to have a cardiologist who's local to where, you're, where you are in your community. Someone has to do your evaluation and be available to you locally to respond to urgent needs. But you probably should see someone who specializes in HCM in addition to that. And the way we like to do that is work in combination with those local teams to uh, manage as much care as we can locally, but when it comes to advanced diagnostic procedures or surgical procedures, then they probably should come to a center that really is doing a lot of these. The next question talks about the risk of apical myectomy, heart cell. So we talked about what you talk to patients for the subaortic myectomy. What do you, what do you counsel the right. patients for the apical myectomy? Well, the risk of an apical myectomy depends on the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. If it's an apical myectomy to enlarge the left ventricle, the upfront or the early risk of that procedure would be about 3%. Um, if we're talking about an apical incision or the apical approach for the mid ventricle, the risk of that operation is low, less than 1%, probably the same risk as a subaortic mm -hmm. uh, myectomy. So the risk depends on which problem we're trying to address mm -hmm. through the transapical approach. And technically, for you in the operating room, is, is, is transaortic or transapical more challenging as a, as a procedure from a surgeon's standpoint? I think, I think it was more challenging initially, but as we become more comfortable with the operation, we have a lower threshold. And you and I have mm -hmm. had many cases together where we decide that we need to do both the transapical yeah and the transaortic myectomy to get complete relief right. of obstruction. So I think we're seeing more, more complicated cases, but we're also, mm -hmm. I think, have a lower threshold for doing this transapical approach. Yeah, as we've gotten more experience with it. Right. Um, what are the statistical outcomes of apical myectomy? So uh, as, as Hartzell mentioned, he and, and our colleagues first thought of this operation because the patients were coming to us because their only option was transplant right. and and you and Jamil and Rick uh, said gosh there must be something better we can do for patients than have them get a transplant and so what have our publications shown us about the outcomes of these patients yes I it's it's a very important point that, that we're, we're balancing in most patients the risk of this operation the two to three to four percent risk which is higher than the risk of cardiac surgery for other conditions against the, the difficulties of transplant. So it, it is risky enough up front that we don't offer it to anybody with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy unless they're very limited. But once they get through the, the operation, we've seen some dramatic improvement in, in patients in terms of their functional capacity. We don't know how long that will last, whether it's going to last 15 or 20 years. That seems to be, it seems to be durable in terms of the symptom relief for 5 to 10 years, right. I'd say. Yeah, so I, I know just anecdotally one patient of mine who had who came for the transplant evaluation, we did an apical myectomy. She ended up getting a transplant 10 years after her apical right. myectomy, but in her mind and in my mind, that was 10 years without being a transplant patient. Right. So she was she was happy with that course because again it's a it's a very different ball game to become a transplant recipient. Right, and I think that's a very good point. And yeah. we're, we are very careful to explain to patients, even the patients that come for septal myectomy, that operation doesn't cure you of the disease of hypertrophic right. cardiomyopathy. Uh, a septal myectomy cures you of obstruction, but right. you still have the underlying disease. And the same thing with an apical hypertrophic right. cardiomyopathy. Yeah. 
I think it's probably worthwhile for us talking a little bit about how we evaluate the patients who's a candidate. Because I know there's a question about who's a candidate amongst the apical patients uh, for that. And I think that it's a really good question because not everyone has thickening as dramatic as the cases we've demonstrated today. There are people who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who have mild thickening of their heart. And so what we've learned to do over time is we look at the echo and we look at things like a cardiac MRI or a CT scan to just look at the size of the heart. Right. And if the heart is small, if the chamber is small, we feel that that is the, the starts to be the patients that you, you more think about. But more and more, we've been focusing on actually some of the hemodynamic numbers. What's the actual volume of blood the heart ejects with each heartbeat? And if that's too small, right. then I think we feel better about talking to those patients about you're a good candidate for this right. procedure. And when we first started doing this operation, we were looking at ventriculograms mm -hmm. and echocardiograms, and now we have cardiac MRI and CT and so forth that can actually give us estimates of ventricular volume and stroke yeah. volume, and that's been, that's been very useful in sorting out which patients have a low stroke volume and would be a candidate. So I, th I, th I think we'll become better at selecting patients in the future. Yeah, I think. yeah so, the, so the evaluation will include you know, taking the history of the patient, it will include the echocardiogram, it probably includes some exercise testing, and then a, an MRI to look at the size of the heart. And maybe in some patients, we also measure those pressures in the, in the cath lab, just to make sure when we're getting ready to do that operation that we can look that patient in the eye and say, we think this is gonna do you well to have this operation. Right, and Steve, you're, you're, when you mentioned exercise testing, that, that reminded me of one thing that I wanted to say no. that people might be interested in. One of the things from the surgeon's view, when we see patients who are referred for surgery, to see how often patients have very gradual onset of symptoms, so gradual that they don't realize how really limited they are. Mm -hmm. So I've had patients, when I met with them before surgery, and I say, how are you getting along? And they say, I'm getting along pretty well, and I have a little shortness of breath. And then you ask them what they can do, and they really can't do very much. Mm -hmm. And you look at their exercise test, and mm -hmm. they're at 50% of a functional aerobic capacity. Yeah. So the disability with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obstructive or non-obstructive, can come on very slowly and insidiously, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. All right, so we have another question. Um, my children of my deceased husband have been getting checked every three years since one year of age. Nothing so far, no thickening, and they're 12 and 11. Should they begin yearly screening or continue every three years? So that's a good question. Typically, as they get to adolescence, the onset of puberty, we recommend screening with an echocardiogram and electrocardiogram every year uh, during that adolescent time period. Um, it is pretty rare for us to detect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, in younger children. Not impossible, but rare. But we think most of it starts showing up when they are going through adolescence, their teens, and early 20s is when we're more likely to detect it. So we would probably recommend uh, for most patients in this category to start screening annually. Uh, the next question is, how significant is concentric remodeling after myectomy? It's been nine years. This finding has shown up on my last two echoes. So eccentric remodeling is, uh, is a uh, complicated uh, concept about the heart starting to um, dilate a little bit. And it's hard to say, depending on the myectomy that was performed, whether that is true remodeling that is occurring as part of the natural progression of the disease or whether that was actually remodeling done by the surgeon right. in the operating room because where you take the measurements with the echocardiogram are impacted by the myectomy procedure the surgeon performed. And that, that reminds me too of one very common question that patients have and that's does the muscle grow back? Yeah. And it's important for people to understand that as far as we know, we've not seen instances where after an adequate septal myectomy, mm -hmm. that muscle has grown back. Now, you can have continued thickening in other areas of the heart, but we've not seen recurrent obstruction due to regrowth. Yeah, yeah that, I think the one thing that I remember Dr. Duraney talking to me about is sometimes when a child has an operation under the age of 10, the natural growth of the heart might 
overwhelm the myectomy that was performed in a really young child, but that's different than an adult having a myectomy where the muscle in that area is not regrowing. And, and the other difference there, too, is that some of the children have tunnel subaortic stenosis, which is not the same that's disease the same. Yeah. As, as hypertrophic yeah. cardiomyopathy, yeah. so it's more complicated. There's another question here that I think is a really important one, and I, and I want to see how you respond to that. So people often ask us about, how, well, how does the scar that you get from the myectomy heal, and, and what happens to that? My doctors have said that might cause heart rhythm problems. So tell us about the scar after myectomy. Well, there's, there's two parts to this. The, the first question that people have is, do we leave a scar when we take the muscle out from the septum? And we really don't. Um, when we excise that muscle, we don't have to sew up any bleeding sites or anything. We just remove a piece of muscle. Now, it ends up getting covered by a very thin layer of, of endocardium, but that's not the same as a scar. So there's really no scar on the inside after a septal myectomy. Then this is done through the aorta, so we don't cut through heart muscle to do a septal myectomy in the subaortic area. Yeah. It's a separate issue about this, this transapical incision and the concern about scar tissue and residual scar tissue and arrhythmias was brought up when we first discussed the operation locally and when we talk at, at other meetings. Surgeons want to know and cardiologists want to know whether when we go through the apex, remove that muscle and then close the apex, does that set up a scar? Well, it does set up a scar, but we really don't know that it increases the risk of arrhythmias in those patients, but it's a it's something that we're watching carefully, I'd say. It's also interesting to point out that the patients that have that pouch, in many cases, that's already a scar, which is then easier for you to enter and close right. after the fact. Right. It's, it's, if it's a thin wall scar, then that there's no issue. Right. The scar is already there. Yeah. Regarding any type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, do you see differences in diagnosis or treatments by gender? That is a really good question. So. Generally speaking, the genetics of this would suggest that there shouldn't be any differences based on gender. But we have seen data from our own patients that it seems that, that women tend to have more adverse outcomes over the long term. And we haven't seen that specifically with respect to operations, but we have seen that just in, in general. And, and the question uh, that the, the person who asked the question is probably alluding to, we see that in many cardiovascular diseases mm -hmm. that for, for not well understood reasons, women tend to do worse with some cardiac diseases than others. In coronary artery disease, it's felt that because they present with atypical symptoms, they might come later in their course um, than men come to evaluation. But that isn't the same, it's not the same process in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we actually have a team uh, at Mayo that's trying to investigate the differences between men with HCM and women with HCM so we can understand that better. The, the next question has to do with whether a patient should have alcohol septal ablation or surgery. And I think that would be a good one for you to start on and then maybe I'll Sure. So, so that, that is a good question because alcohol ablation, we used to call it new, but it's been around for 15 years now, so it's hard to call that a new therapy. What we've learned about this procedure, which is done with a catheter, uh, again, just to remind the audience, it's, it's done with a catheter rather than with a scalpel, and we inject alcohol into the septum, which essentially causes an intentional heart attack in that really thick area of the heart so that it scars out of the way. We know that patients that do well with ablation do about the same as the patients with myectomy, but about 20 to 25 percent of patients won't respond to the ablation because you're, you're stuck where the coronary artery goes and it doesn't always line up. As a surgeon, you right. can address we the can hypertrophy see. wherever it is. When we're using catheters in the coronary arteries, we're kind of, our hands are tied a little bit. So when we do an evaluation in the clinic trying to help patients decide whether they're going to have myectomy or ablation, the thicker the heart muscle, the higher the gradient, the younger the patient, all favor having an operation. If patients are really frail, where we start to get concerned about whether they're hardy enough to undergo heart operation, to have the cardiopulmonary bypass, that's when we start favoring the ablation as a more attractive alternative. Now, we've 
sometimes shared patients before we've made a decision and we've shared that decision. So, right. so how do you approach that patient? Because I'm sure patients ask you all the time as well. Well, I, there's a couple, yeah, those are all important considerations. The other thing to think about, especially for young patients, is the risk of need of a pacemaker. Yep. And, and in every series of patients that had alcohol ablation, that's a little higher than the risk of need of a pacemaker after surgery. The other problem is that the, the risk of need for a pacemaker if you have alcohol ablation and then surgery is about 30, 20 to 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So if the alcohol ablation doesn't work and then you need an operation, you know, having a pacemaker in is not a big problem for an elderly person, but I, we wouldn't want to saddle a young person mm -hmm. uh, with that. So that's one other uh, consideration. The, the, the other one that's important, and it gets back to the scar. And, and we know with ablation that there is definitely a scar left in the, deep within the heart muscle. It's, it's the intended purpose of the ablation, but that scar can be a focus for um, dangerous heart literature right. to set up. The studies that have looked at this have been kind of a mixed bag, but we don't have, as opposed to the first slides you started off with showing the great benefits of myectomy where there's no scar, we have enough uneasiness about what the scar after ablation means that we have to have a more considerate discussion about particularly a young patient long-term risk of dangerous heart rhythms right and and to just put a point on how we how we make a decision that cardiologists obviously discuss both of these alternatives with the patients when they meet with them and, and explain the pros and cons of each procedure yeah. um, so that's something that's mentioned up front, and then they may want to speak to a surgeon, they may want to speak to an interventional cardiologist. The, the next question is also uh, an interesting one, and that is, uh, when do we do angiograms and cardiac catheterizations? It used to be every patient having heart evaluations had these procedures done, and it's becoming less and less. Um, when we send patients uh, to you for, for myectomy, if they have risk factors for coronary artery disease, or they're of a certain age, we go ahead and do an, a coronary angiogram right. to make sure that if you're gonna be in operating on that heart that they don't have severe coronary artery disease, it's either gonna make their operation riskier or might need a bypass graft at the same time. The other case where we do that is if the studies like the echocardiogram are inconclusive and the patient is having lots of symptoms, but we haven't really demonstrated the hemodynamic problem. Sometimes we get it because the echo images just aren't good enough then sometimes measuring those pressures directly in the cath lab, just as you do in the operating room, help us make a decision about next courses of therapy. And the, the, the final thing has to do with, with the patient's symptoms. We mentioned the symptoms you can have with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and obstruction include shortness of breath, you can have lightheadedness, what we call presyncope, or, or you can have chest pain angina. So if a patient has angina, that would lean, that would yep. persuade us to, to get the angiogram, even if they have few risk factors for coronary disease, because the other thing we sometimes see is bridging. Right. And so the, the symptoms influence whether or not we would exactly. get an angiogram. Yeah. There's a question here about uh, imaging uh, someone who's obese um, and the transthoracic echo images have been suboptimal. So I'll just talk about that generally, and then there's another little piece of that, that situation. So um, interestingly, patients who are obese sometimes have still pretty good echocardiographic images, but sometimes the ultrasound that is used in echo just doesn't give you good pictures of the heart. And that's where we tend to use cardiac MRI to look at patients to get a better understanding of their wall thickness and their chamber size. Now, the person who asked the question also put in there the tidbit that the patient has a defibrillator, and, and older generation defibrillators, meaning anything more than the last year or so, couldn't be put into MRI machines because of interference. And if that was the case, then we would use a, a cardiac CT scan to assess the thickness of that heart, so that would be a viable alternative to that. More and more, the newer uh, pacemakers and defibrillators can be done uh, with MRI using special protocols, but those, that's also limited to a very few centers that really understand the nuances of the type of MRI scanner they have, the type of device they have, the indication for the device, and whether those things might be dangerous. The next question uh, has to do with a patient who has an LVAD, and would, be he, uh, would he be a good candidate? Uh, if someone has a pacemaker, would they still be a candidate for surgery? Well, 
If a patient has an LVAD in, in general, they wouldn't have the kind of problem with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we've just talked about. They wouldn't be a candidate for a septal myectomy or for a procedure to enlarge the ventricle. The issue of a pacemaker, though, is, is important. We see lots of patients that have either pacemakers put in because of conduction problems or defibrillators put in before surgery, or they may need a defibrillator. Dr. Amon may see someone and think that they are at a high enough risk for sudden cardiac death that they need a defibrillator. We do the operation, try not to uh, interfere with the function of the pacemaker, but then always they're checked in the early postoperative period and then adjusted as necessary. If, a, if the patient needs a defibrillator, then that's put in on like the second or third day after surgery. So we don't do the two procedures simultaneously. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the question of the LVAD is an interesting one. It's probably worth mentioning. Ab about 3% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy convert from being this thick hypertrophied heart to one that starts to dilate and get big and baggy. And those are the big baggy hearts are not one that we would do right. myectomy for. They start to turn into the more similar to patients who have what was called dilated cardiomyopathy. And when the heart muscle is so weak to pump, that's when we've used more and more LVADs to help right. those patients. So a slightly different phase of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we've got time for two more questions. The first one is from a patient who has a 2.1 centimeter or 21 millimeter septum and is having myectomy. Their son also has HCM with a 2.5 centimeter septum. Should he have an apical myectomy? So I'll start and, and I would say the first question is, is just because you have hypertrophy doesn't mean you need to have any therapy. Patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and are asymptomatic don't even require medications if they are active and truly asymptomatic. And to your right. point, we usually do the exercise test right. to make sure that's the case. If he has apical hypertrophy to 2.5 centimeters and he has symptoms, and his ventricle is small, then that's when we would start talking together about would he be a candidate for an apical myectomy. But this issue of, of the size of the septum or the, the measurement of the septum often comes up for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and obstruction. In the past, there were uh, guidelines that suggested that surgeons shouldn't do a subaortic myectomy if the, if the septum is less than 18, mil, is 18 yeah. millimeters or less. And it's been our experience that with a careful myectomy carried far enough into the ventricle that we've not put a lower limit on the thickness of the septum as long as they have obstruction due to what we call systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. If they have the typical echo features of obstruction, we don't think there's a lower limit to the thickness of the septum. Now, we would do that if it's subaortic obstruction through the aorta, not through the apex. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we'll finish on, on a last question where someone asked about the fact that they had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and had atrial fibrillation. And so what do you talk to the patients about in terms of does the myectomy itself reduce their risk of recurrence for atrial fibrillation? And, and, and talk about our decision making yeah. about, about handling that. Yep. Well, that's a good question. And, and to be uh, upfront about it, we don't know the long-term effects of relieving obstruction on atrial arrhythmias. It's very common to have the atrial arrhythmias in patients with symptomatic obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what often happens is a patient with obstruction will be minimally symptomatic until they develop atrial fibrillation, and then they really go downhill. Yep. So each episode of atrial fibrillation results in a decline in their exercise capacity. They often will have seen an electrophysiologist and have the atrial arrhythmia treated, and then when they come to us, they're more concerned about the atrial arrhythmia than the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Right. So when we talk to them about surgery, we can do a myectomy and a procedure to get rid of the atrial fibrillation, but it's successful only about 60 to 70 percent of the time. But I try to emphasize to the patients that they shouldn't be discouraged by that because once you relieve the obstruction, even if they're in atrial fibrillation, they'll be much less symptomatic. I mean. Yeah, that's similar to what I talk about. It, it, it makes intuitive sense physiologically. If you decrease the stress the heart is right. under to deal with pumping blood to the heart, that the atrial fibrillation burden will become less. Right. And I even would counsel similar things with the apical myectomy. We don't know that treating the apical myectomy is definitely going to make the atrial fibrillation better. But if the heart is feeling better under less pressure, the, the atria will be less stretched. But I, I, like you, have often told my patients, we can do the 
maze procedure or something during the operation, while and if it doesn't reduce the AFib, your atrial fibrillation is still better tolerated. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a very important yeah. point. Well, I think it is time for us to wrap up today. We thank you for joining us, and again, please visit uh, the event site and the website for more information about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other cardiac diseases, and Hartzell, thanks for your insights today. Thank you. Yeah.